like male genes were getting skinnier and skinnier and so the next natural step was obviously for men to start wearing leggings it was kind of happening in the sport and yoga world back then and so we were like instead of jumping on that trend of like making like af leisure wear which would have been a good idea we were like we're going to change male fashion and we designed some leggings got them made in china and started selling them through an e-com store managed to like hack our way onto dragon stand which is like shark tank in the u.s didn't get any investment raised there and got actually humiliated. Hey everyone, we've got an amazing guest today, Tom Hunt. He is the founder of Fame and it's on track to do about $3.6 million this year, but he claims he has no idea what he's doing. In this conversation, we talk about the businesses that he tried and failed. There was about 17 of them. How he bootstrapped his business, how he manages 71 full-time employees that are all remote, and we talk about LinkedIn. He's killing it. His follower count has grown from 25,000 to 100,000 in just less than two months. And he reveals some of his hacks. Special shout out to B2B Pod Pros, my company. If you're a SaaS brand that's looking to reach new audiences and generate high quality leads, you can get on our wait list. Just go to b2bpodpros.com. All right, let's dive into the conversation with Tom. Tom Hunt, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Eric, I'm honored to be here. No, I am honored. I've been following you for a while. A bit of background for the audience. Tom has tried and failed at 17 different businesses, but he's actually having a lot of success with Fame, a B2B podcast agency that helps B2B brands produce and grow their podcasts. His team is fully remote. There's 71 full-time employees, and they're on pace to do about $3.5 million, maybe more and according to his LinkedIn pro profile, he has no idea what he's doing. Tom, I thought we could talk about four things here. What did you learn from one of the businesses that you failed at? What did you learn the most? The second thing is fame. The first year, you're a bootstrapper. You know, what did your day-to-day -day look like? The third topic, LinkedIn. You've gone from like 25,000 followers to almost 100,000 in less than two months. And then the fourth thing is, I think you're a bit of an introvert. At least that's what you've shared on LinkedIn. So I want to know, you know, how does an introvert lead people? Because you've got a pretty sizable company here. So I'm curious uh, to know more about that. So starting with the first topic, obviously, we're not going to dive into all 17 businesses. But is there one where you felt like you, you actually learned a lot? I think the most formative attempt was a male leggings company that my, me and my two best friends started in 2013. First business, or maybe first or second. And we noticed that like male jeans were getting skinnier and skinnier. And so the next natural step was obviously for men to start wearing leggings. It was kind of happening in the sport and yoga world back then. And so we were like, instead of jumping on that trend of like making like af leisure wear, which would have been a good idea. We were like, we're going to change male fashion. And we designed some leggings, got them made in China and started selling them through an e-com store. Managed to like hack our way onto Dragon Stand, which is like Shark Tank in the US. Didn't get any investment raised there and got actually humiliated. Over from 2013, 2017, we probably sold about two to 3,000 pairs. So not like horrendous. But the big learning there was that none of us had any experience in fashion or manufacturing. And I think the reason why it failed was because the product that we created and distributed was like, it was okay wearable for a year or something, but it wasn't great. And so my learning there is that, and this is something that I truly believe now, I think we're doing an okay job at it of fame, is if you can just build something that's like significantly better than competitors or the same slash slightly better, but a lower cost, then you will grow and the business will work. And then you put marketing on top to speed up the growth. So that's something we didn't realize then, but it's something that we've learned. And so a thing we believe retention of the foundation of growth. And so big focus of our time is like, how do we make service better and clients happier? Because if we do that, we know the company is going to grow. Yeah. A uh, few questions about this business. Did you give away any free leggings to the sharks that were in the Din show? I'm pretty sure they got like, cause we had samples and we gave the samples out. I don't think we got the samples back. So it doesn't mean that they actually, they probably didn't wear them to be honest. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, they're one, one of them said, I quote, you do realize that in 20 years, this is going to be on YouTube and your kids are going to be watching. So this was 10 years ago. It's still on YouTube. 
And actually one of us, one of the three does have a kid, but the kid's only like six months old. Yeah. So he's probably going to see it in a couple of years. So, <laughs> so that, that dragon, Duncan Ballantyne, was correct. Okay. I'm a bit surprised that you sold a few thousand. Who, who was buying these? Where were they buying them from? There was a few customer segments. <laughs> so they're buying them from meggings.com, which was our domain. And I would say the majority were buying them for running or yoga or the gym or CrossFit. Okay. Then we had a small selection for like fancy dress at festivals. And then we had the rest were like people that believed in the mission of us changing male fashion. And so they would buy them for proper <laughs> outfits. But that, that was only a small proportion. Okay. You know how you see cars out there and they're advertising their, their business, you know, their advertisement on the car with the name and everything. Were you wearing these pants or, or whatever you want to call them like every day to promote them? Me personally, I was like probably wearing them once a week. Okay. So I wear them to the gym, I wear them running and would wear them socially on like very specific occasions. Okay. I'm surprised that three guys got together and they're like, this is a great idea. I mean, obviously one person has ideas, two, now you got a team, but three, that's kind of an anomaly. Are you still friends with those two other former business? Still like my best, still like my best friends. One of them has gone on to a great, much bigger company than fame. Hopefully he learned as well from the experience. Okay. All right. Let's dive into our second topic here. And that is fame. You're a bootstrapper and you're very proud of that. I, I'm a bootstrapper myself. I'm really curious to know what was that first year like, Tom, and what was that day-to-day? -day, what did that look like for you? How, how did you get the traction? How did you get your initial customers? What were you really focused on? And if you're looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently that you know now? So I think this is one of the reasons why we have been successful in that the leader, which is me, has done absolutely every role in the company. So... Let's break it down in terms of the day-to-day. -day. I was probably spending 10% of my time on sales and marketing. We basically got the first leads through Google paid on organic. So I was like running that. And then I was doing sales calls, 10, 20% of the time. It wasn't, that, it wasn't a massive amount of lead flow. But that echoes what I was saying earlier about retention of the foundation growth, really focusing on making the clients that we did have happy. So after one year, we probably had like eight clients at the end of the year, started at one. And so throughout the year, that 80% that I wasn't, spent, wasn't spending on growth was spent on delivery. So... We have different roles in the company now, like which is the project manager, the account manager, the account director, they have the creative team that do all the production. So I was being project manager, account manager, and account director on all the clients. So I did have a project manager based in the Philippines, but then I had to like train them up. And so I was doing that role at the start. And then I was the, the main contact for all the clients. And then I was doing the account director stuff, which was like the main strategy work. So I was really just in the weeds. I was like self-employed essentially. I think maybe at the end of the first year, we had our first account manager. And so then I would have handed a couple of clients over to them. But I was just delivering 80% delivering of clients, 20% selling, and then no percent on strategy. Okay. And so your first hire was the account manager. So, so when we started, basically, I started for Fame because at my last, I was employed in 2019. We started a podcast, went really well. They became the first client. And so there's one guy based in the Philippines who was in my team there came across as the first project manager. And so that was like the first full-time person. And then for the creative team, we would just have freelancers, freelance editors, freelance designers, et cetera. But then the, the next high after that was an account manager who would actually be the main uh, point of contact for the client. Got you. Now, is there anything that you would have done differently looking back? The obvious answer to that is higher earlier. Well, that's like typical business advice, I think, to like get out of the weeds. But looking back, A, for me to do that would have been higher risk. I would have had to put more money into the company. I think I put like 400 pounds. And so to like run a loss for the first few months to hire someone earlier would have cost more, so it would have been higher risk. And then B, I wouldn't have got as good at those roles. And so when I needed to write the documentation for doing those roles for onboarding and for hiring, I would have been worse. So I actually think it was a good time investment. And for anyone listening, who's building a bootstrapping a service company. I think first six months, try to do everything yourself because if you are going to train or hire someone else to do it, the better you are, the easier that process is going to be. And this is actually any role we've created in the company, apart from the audio editing and the design, I could basically do as good as anyone in the company probably. And so that has enabled us to grow with lower risk. E.g. we're more successful at hiring, we're more successful at onboarding and more successful at managing. What were you focused on? Were you, you've got this, this project manager on board, account manager on board. Was it pretty much the, the same thing? 
like the same focus or a different thing that you focused on? I only got completely out of client work in the last six months. So, but it has, it probably has come down. So that 80% first year, maybe 60% second year, 50%, third year, 30%, fourth year, and then now zero. So in the second year, let's break that down. It was probably a bit more on sales or, or we'll call it growth, which is I call sales and marketing, maybe 30% because we had a higher lead flow and I had less clients because I had the account manager. So maybe 30% on sales. And then let's say it was like 40% delivering clients, client work, and then the remaining part, 30%. I was probably actually then like doing what I like to call level three work, which is like designing processes. So level one is actually doing the thing. Level two is managing the person doing the thing. Level three is designing or deciding what work is to be done. And so I think in year, year two, I actually started doing level three work where I was maybe documenting the account manager onboarding process or document how we hire account managers or document how we do a specific thing for a client. And then I think the really good way of, of looking at the entrepreneurial journey is looking at the stages of the work. So it goes from one to five. I outlined the first three and four is taking systems and departments and making them work well together, which is really what I'm doing now. And then five is like looking to the future. And so what a typical entrepreneur should see is that they will, will graduate through their stages. At the start, they'll be doing a lot of stage one, but then by year three, four, five, six, they're hopefully doing more stage three, four or five. So that my journey has followed that framework pretty closely. Okay. okay. And I imagine in the very beginning, you're probably working, I, I don't know, 80 hour weeks, maybe even more. Did that gradually come down the past six months? Because you're posting these lovely pictures like in Rome and on the beach. I'm like, okay, I know this guy is not working crazy like he was the first year. You got some yeah. time to relax now a little bit, right? Yeah, I think what I've really realized recently is that for like strategic roles, so it's only level three and above, your output or your productivity is really not defined by how many hours you work. In the early days, like if I had a shed load of level one work, e.g. I had eight clients to look after, my output or my productivity kind of is correlated with how many hours I work because I just have to keep them all happy. But when you're doing level three and above, it's really like having an insight or thinking about something can make you wildly productive. And that often doesn't happen when you're sat at your desk trying to do a task. So I think my workload has probably only come down in the last six months as I've been doing more level three and above work. For the, for the previous four years, it's been pretty... 12 hours a day times five would be 60, probably not up to 80. I reckon like 50 to 70 hour weeks consistently. Yeah. It sounds like the first year, maybe the percentage of time that you spent strategically thinking about the business was pretty small, maybe 5%, but now it seems like it's much, much higher, maybe 30, 40%. Yeah. Now like LinkedIn is 95% now, i <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. You're, you're totally right. It's about 30%, I think. Okay, good. Well, that's a good segue into LinkedIn because... I first discovered you maybe about a year ago. You had maybe around 20,000 followers back then. And of course, we're in the same industry, podcasting. And I just thought, wow, I really admire what you've done with your business because it's kind of like that's the kind of business model that I want to be in a few years. And I've noticed the past couple of months, it's like you, you've hacked it somehow. I know you talk about hacking LinkedIn thought, ship, thought, uh, thought leadership ads, but in terms of organic following, it's almost 100,000 now. So what strategy have you put into place to achieve that growth, Tom? Any secrets that you want to share? I've got three things and a bonus one. You, you're totally right. It went from like 25,000 to 93,000 in like two months, I think, two, three months. And so the three things that I changed. First is I never used to engage on anyone's posts, really. And now that's like 30 minutes a day I'm engaging. And what I like about that is obviously it's going to help it helps with the algorithm. Like if you're engaging LinkedIn, those are your contributing, et cetera. But then it also, I think, makes it more sustainable because you're adding value to other people and that makes you feel good. And if you feel good, then you're going to keep doing it. Whereas if you're just focused on like creating posts, trying to grow your own profile, it's like quite selfish and it doesn't make me feel as good. So that, that's one of the things that like if you want to grow 30 minutes a day, engaging with, with your people that comment on your posts and also just other random people. Second thing is increasing the amount of content you create that has proven to get engagement before. Now you can't copy stuff. People have accused me of copying stuff. <laughs> I like to think I'm inspired by other people, but to sustain large amounts of engagement, the algorithm has to see your content as content that consistently gets a lot of engagement. And so any post you do that only gets like 10 likes, make the algorithm think that you're not as good anymore. And so you have to consistently have bangers, basically. 
And the way you lower the risk of not having a banger is by just seeing other people in your niche and looking at content that they're creating that does get engagement and then using that to inspire your content. It, obviously, you have to believe in it and you have to not copy, but that has been big for me as well, is okay. trying to consistently have bangers. Third, the analogy I'll give here is like of the bamboo tree that for like five years won't actually grow, it's still below the ground. And then in six months, it grows like 17 feet. And so I've been posting consistently on LinkedIn for like two to three years. And only let me, let me just explain the growth in the last three months. So I think that's a good analogy. And the reason I think that's happened is practice. So I've written, I don't know, like 500 LinkedIn posts that haven't got more than 50 likes. And so when I finally got these other two keys, the first two we've discussed, then I was ready. My skill set was basically ready. Like I knew how to write a post that would get engagement. So that's the third one. And the bonus one, to like get the super viral post, like plus over a hundred, a thousand likes, people will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help them throw rocks at their enemies. Mm -hmm. And so for the super viral posts, you have to create a vibe or write content that does one of those things. If you throw stones at their enemies, allay their fears. That's how you get like the super engagement that fuels the virality. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I understood now why a lot of your posts like around management, micromanagement, or remote work, why they work so well. Just from the, what you said from that quote. I get it because you've got so many posts about remote work and why, you know, why you shouldn't micromanage. And it's, it's definitely resonates with people who enjoy remote work, who see that post and like, that's me. Yeah. I don't want somebody hanging over my shoulder and always, you know, asking, what are you doing? You know, where did you go? I get it now. Makes sense. Are the photos a strategic tactic that you're using? Because I notice a lot of the images you're never really looking at the camera. They're always like a side profile. Maybe you're looking down at your dog. Maybe it's like a picture of your back and the sunset. And I'm like, I wonder if he knows something about photo images because uh, you're never looking at the photo. Whereas most people who post a selfie, they're looking at the, at the, at the camera. Yeah. So a few things on this. Single image posts, at least since I started posting them, work the best. So you need an image. Then the other thing I've noticed is that if there's a face, that's like relatively big, not like super far away. That always performs better. So those are two things that anyone can take away. The dog thing is, I think it's useful. It is quite like advanced, I think, is that if you want people to follow you in your story, then it's useful to have other characters in the story that people can notice and like start to like or dislike. The point about not looking at the camera, this is just personal preference. I just don't like, I don't know why. I just think it's cheesy. Whenever I see a picture of myself looking at the camera, I just don't really like it. And so it's more of just a stylistic thing. There's nothing, it's probably better to look at the camera for LinkedIn pics, but I just don't like them. Okay, totally makes sense. All right, last question before we get into rapid fire. You said that you're a bit of an introvert. And uh, I'm just wondering, how does an introvert lead a team of 71 people? Or is there any advice that you can give to other introverts who may be listening? Yeah, I think it's interesting. The typical CEO wants to have an office, to have people around them, loves going to networking events and conferences. And I think that probably does make for a better CEO in general, but their disadvantages, I think, maybe their lack of ability to form or like empathy in one-on-one -on -one situations. That, that's something that I'm, I think I'm really good at. And so the way I'm the CEO of fame, it's like I don't do any of those things that the external extroverted CEOs do. I like sit behind my laptop, write LinkedIn posts, have a lot of one-on-ones. Like that's not exhausting for me. Like big group meetings where I have to talk or present are more exhausting. So we have a leadership team meeting with just four of us. I have a no agenda one-on-ones, which are just one-on-one -on -one meetings with random people on the team every week. And aside from that, that's most of like the internal stuff that I do. And so, and none of that saps my energy. So I think to summarize, if I built the business and my role to leverage my strength as an introvert, and it seems to be working, but then we obviously don't have a test case where the fame version in an alt, in a alt, alternate universe where we have an office, everyone's there, and I go to loads of conferences, like maybe the business would be double the size, you know? So I think that the learning here is that if anyone's an entrepreneur building a company, understand what you are best at and try to build the business in a way that enables you to leverage their strength. Tom, do you get people reaching out to you, other CEOs or founders for asking for advice on how to build a really good culture when a lot of your team is remote? Yeah, that question comes up quite a lot, typically in LinkedIn comments. I say 
the most important thing is have values that like actually that you believe in that resonate with you and that mean something like specific enough, not honesty and honesty and integrity. There's the first step is define those. And then there are three steps. First, define them. Second, hire, fire, promote, and bonus based on them. And the third is just continually remind people about them. And if you do step two, then people probably will be continually reminded because if they're interviewing people, they'll know to check the values. If they want to give bonuses, they have to check the values. That's something that we've learned is that make sure the values resonate with you, the founder, and then just continually like CRO, like chief reminding officer, keep reminding people. And you do that by making sure you hire, fire, promote and bonus people based on them. Got you. Do you have your values displayed anywhere? Is it like on your website or anything? I'm just curious. Yeah, they're on the website in meetings. I used to do this a lot, but I don't run the meetings anymore. So I used to run like the whole team meetings and I'd be like, just quiz people on the values and until like everyone had to know them. So it's client, client, client. And you can tell me if you think they're tangible enough. Client, 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 basically we choose the client first. Action bias, which is we prefer to just do stuff and learn. Operational excellence with any people business, you need like strict processes and documentation. And then so growing both client podcasts, the business and ourselves. Okay. Thank you so much, Tom. I got a few rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Just give me the first thing that pops into your head. The first thing that pops into my head is probably going to be just thinking about the values then and how we used to do this thing. What was a favorite childhood toy that you played with? I used to have a teddy bear called Winnie the Pooh. Second question, a song that you can listen to over and over again. Right now is called Dead Beat Gospel by Barry Can't Swim. Okay, what's the most interesting thing you did in the last 26 days? So that was post-Rome. I think it was have a... So I've got, I used to play football a lot, and then I took like 18 years of not playing football. And then in the last three, year, three years, I started playing football again. And I had a coaching session with a football coach, which because I hadn't been coached for like 18 years. So I went back to it and developed all these bad habits and... He was like pointing them out to me. So that was the most eye opening. <laughs> okay. All right. Last question for you. Instead of taking aspirin for pain relief, you do what? Recently, I've been lying on the thing called a Shakti mat. I don't even know what that is. It's like a mat no. with loads of spikes on it. And you like, so I have a bath and then I'll lie on the mat for 20 minutes without a t shirt and you're just lying it on the bed. And I don't know about pain relief, but it's like, makes me so sleepy so after if i do that in the evening have the bath and go on that and then i'll just like fall asleep straight away is it made out of rubber or with material made the spikes of plastic like it hurts but not too much you know like it doesn't draw blood but it's just like it, it, it's definitely uncomfortable but you get used to it all right do you feel is it health benefits i feel super sleepy afterwards but i haven't notice really anything else it's good because you line it you can't really read or go on your phone and so for 20 minutes you're just lying down which i think is a good exercise anyway and then it makes me sleepy, which is good, but I don't know if there's any health benefits apart from that. I'm sure the Shakti might people say that, but I haven't experienced them yet. Okay. All right. There you have it, folks. Tom Hunt, founder of Fame. I will put links to Tom's LinkedIn profile. Make sure you follow him as well as the Fame website. Tom, thank you so much for coming on Innovators Can Laugh. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I learned a great deal and uh, it was a pleasure having you on the show. All right, for everybody listening, if you enjoy this, feel free to subscribe, tell others about it, and uh, stay tuned for next week when I'll have another very innovative guest on the show. Thank you.